Hello, good evening, and welcome to History on Your Doorstep here on Bro Radio with me, Graham Lovelock Edwards. In tonight's programme, um, hot on the heels of talking about graveyards and cemeteries last time, um, we're staying we're staying on the on the darker side, and we're going to be talking about the institutions that used to be known as asylums, uh, lunatic asylums, to give them the, the rather crude name that they were known as at the time. Um, and we're going to be looking at uh, what the institutions were all about, where they were where they came from, who put them up, what happened to them, all that type of thing, because they did dominate quite a large part of this area, particularly around the Bridgend area, where there seemed to be a, a, a particularly strong concentration of them. So this isn't a subject that I can uh, talk on for very, very long, so I'm delighted to welcome along um, our expert for today's show, Luven Rees. Hello, Luven. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you here. Uh, for those who don't know her, uh, Luven writes for The Buddy magazine. She's also uh, the person responsible for the Remembering Bridgend Facebook page uh, and also the Hello Historia blogs, uh, which are brilliant and I highly recommend oh, you. you go and look them up. Oh, well, you've kept me going on many, <laughs> uh, many a quiet night. Um, so we're going to start today's show talking uh, about the, the institutions at quite a high level, really. Um, so w- when did when did it, when did sort of asylums come into being in the first place as a thing? Where, where where do they sort of originate from? Well, there's always been some sort of asylums. Mm-hmm. There was one um, Bedlam in London is the most infamous one, it's yeah. the oldest one. But in um, Wales, they came about at the start of the um, 1800s when an act was passed. Mm-hmm to have private lunatic asylum, so before the public asylum, people right. with a lot of money would turn their houses into asylums. Oh, and right. then local guardians would send their lunatics there. Mm-hmm. And it was an excellent money maker. Yeah. But it also means that the people that were cared for, they weren't actually cared for oh, right. a lot. So there had to be a reform and something had to be done. Yeah. Um, it took a long time. Yeah. Because the Britain Ferry Private Asylum opened in 1843. Yeah. And everyone was sent there, basically. Or they were boarded out to Wells Asylum, to um, Bailbrook Asylum. Yeah. Fish ponds. Right. And one day they decided, actually, we need one closer to home because it would be cheaper. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that was the birth of the ones that, that, that sprung up around Bridgend. Or why were there so many around Bridgend? That's always something I've... Well, wondered. there's actually only one. Oh, right, OK. Because um, the first one that is now Glanreed was built in 1864. Yeah. And then everybody knows Park as a separate one. Oh, I built see. Built in right. 1887. And then Penave that was built in eight, no, 1936. Right. But they're all under the same Wing complex. Such, yeah. So they are... Right. Um, so divisions are the same institution. They're exactly the same. They just spread out a little bit. Right. So Ang- Angleton Asylum, when that got overcrowded, they yeah. built Park. Yeah. So they could send the incurable patients there. Yeah. As a sort of filter. Yeah. And when that got a little bit too much again, they opened Penave for admissions. And Glanreed is still working. It's one of the oldest running mental health um, hospitals in Wales. It's continuously been... A hospital since 1864. Good grief, and still going. Yep. Wow. So the the idea behind them was if people were behaving in it, because obviously they weren't particularly well, uh, they weren't very well versed in being able to diagnose specific issues. I take it back then. So I, what was the what was the criteria for people who um, were sent there? Contrary to popular belief, yeah, it's actually quite hard to get into asylum at the start. Oh. A lot, a lot of people know that. A lot of people think that you could just leave them on the doorstep and they would get taken in. But you needed two um, doctors to sign you off. Mm -hmm. You needed to go through a whole medical procedure. You were taken for three examinations. Yeah. And if they thought you weren't actually mentally ill, you were sent back to the workhouse. It was very hard to actually get into one. Oh, right. And not a lot of people know that. No, I definitely didn't know that. I I, I was of the impression that... Because you you do hear these stories of, of... of of people who have nothing mentally wrong with them at all. It's just that they were maybe that they were pregnant out of wedlock, or that they were just uh, the bane you know. of a historian's life. That one is. <laughs> is that not true? Um, is that a complete? It's a later thing. So in ah, the Victorian times, right? I haven't come across um, in my research. I've looked through ha- uh, th- hundreds of cases, probably even a thousand cases. Yeah. Um, where the um, prime 
reason has never been pregnancy. So oh. someone would be in there because they were having psychosis yeah. because of pregnancy, not because they were pregnant. Right. So they'd have the baby in the asylum and they'd leave with the baby. Oh. Or they'd have, um, they might pop back because they've got postnatal depression. Right. But that would be the reason they're in there, not actually in there because someone's gone, oh, you're pregnant. We don't want to deal you with away. you. That's a much later, so we're talking 1910s type so of it, attitude. So it did happen, but it happened but much, much later on in the It happens later than people think. People think oh. it's a very Victorian attitude. Yeah. But with Victoria, especially in this area, people were sent to, and wed mothers were sent to laundries. So like we have um, laundries on the scale in Ireland. We had them in Cardiff and uh, Newport and Swansea. So yeah. they were more likely to be sent there if they were unwed mothers until right. they had the baby. Yeah. Then the baby would be put into someone like Nazareth House Home. Right. And then the mother would be sent back into the world. So, I see, yeah, I see. Huge... Right, okay. So, so what are, are there any other myths that we, uh, we are harboring oh, and carrying um, around with us that are nonsense? The visitor myth yeah. of um, people basically being left there. Yeah. Sort of, you're in there now, you're not seeing your family. We're done with you. Yeah. May have happened on a very small scale. Right. But with the asylum that I look at, yeah. it... Visiting day was every Saturday. Oh, right. You had an okay. hour to see your family. If they wanted to come and see you, they wrote letters, they wrote postcards. The asylums had their own headed note paper. Right. And views of the asylum that you could send to your family. So there's... So people have sort of spun horror stories out yeah, of... Yeah. Because I, it seems like a scary place. People try to make them even more scary with uh, even yeah, more... Yeah, I think for a lot of cases, people were better off in there. Yeah. You know, you've got three meals a day. You're mm -hmm. being looked after a lot better. It's not perfect, but yeah. it's better than being on the street or in a poor home. But I think a lot of people cling to the notion that it was so terrible. And for a lot of people, it probably was. Mm. But it's not as ghastly as people seem to think it is, especially people refer to that um, being horrible in the Victorian era. And they're quite from... Glamorgan Asylum, they were quite enlightened, you know, the doctor mm -hmm. that first ran Glamorgan Asylum believed in treating the person as soon as possible. Yeah. So he would take, his ethos was to take away any physical cause of insanity mm -hmm. and try and nurture them, give them occupational therapy. The sooner they were in, the sooner they could be cured and the sooner they could go. Yeah. All of, obviously that changed through the years, but yeah. it was... Yeah. They were set up with good intentions in most cases, but with you've got the influx of workers and then big population. You know, at one point there was two thousand people there. Oh right, okay. And things Wasn't become private? Did people have to pay to, for, to, um, to be there? Not in Glamorgan Asylum. You could, because oh. um, there's a public asylum. Right. So you could go in there as a pauper, but yeah. families could pay. Um, Privately, yeah, which doesn't didn't really make much difference to be honest. It just meant the guardians didn't actually have to pay for them, so it was a bit off their back. Right, right, yeah. But other than that, it was they were getting the same treatment. People were just paying. Right, okay. And what sort of treatment was was doled out in these places? Uh, mostly, well, other start because my period of research is eighteen. 43 until 1915 it's a weird scope it's a really weird right, okay. <laughs> bit specific is there a reason for those um, those dates i i think it's because i'm interested in the early development of it understand okay. and up until the first world war which which is another interest so mm -hmm. it's that time mm. scale yeah otherwise i do that every i you know i drive about everyone yeah but you, you can't there's too many people but the the start with Dr. Yellowlees, he, um, there was a ban on seclusion. You weren't allowed to, there was no straight jacket in the hospital mm -hmm. when it was opened. Drugs and sedatives weren't allowed to be used. People were given occupational therapy. Good Lord. So they, the, the asylums themselves, they were self-sufficient. So they had their own water supply, their own gas supply, their own farms, their own bakehouses, their own laundries. Wow. They're like a little home. Yeah. That's yeah, remarkably, uh, that's not at all what I was expecting. I know, you to be but that's me. one of the reasons when there was a cholera outbreak in Bridge End, yeah. the asylums weren't affected because they had their own water supply. Oh, right. Yeah. So, in a, you know, they're their they con own contained community. Yeah. That's, and yeah, the start, it was all good. It yeah. was good. And then that doctor left. 
and then there was an influx of more patients and it's as the years go on so we've got the 1880s the 1890s where doctors start to rely on in my research i found start to rely on drugs right so you've got um digitalis you've got chloroform you've got morphine to subdue patients that are annoying Mm -hmm. and that's the thing when you read the records it's because of their behavior it's not because of something else yeah and then they're put in seclusion and they use straight jackets or they're packed with wet sheets yeah as a form of non-invasive straight jacket so you've got um you can have either cold or warm wet sheets and you're tightly packed yeah them to calm you down right and when did that sort of thing start happening it happened a lot in other asylums. Right. But it started to creep in. Oh, so, so our Glamorgan Asylum was, was a bit of a beacon then by the sounds of it in its early days. From what is written about it and yeah. what I've um, researched, is that, that's, that's what I'm trying to emphasise, the start of it. Yeah. It sounds yeah, really yeah. good. No, I know. But as you go on, <laughs> yeah, it gets a bit... It gets a bit more bleak and a bit dark. Yeah, it gets to what people sort of expect. Right, okay. Yeah. Do we know anything more about this doctor? What was his name? Dr. Yellowlees. Yellowlees, do we know anything more about him? Yes, we do. Um, He's from um, Glasgow. Right. And he came to Bridgend after he graduated Mm -hmm. in uh, Edinburgh. That's where most of the doctors came from. Until the 1920s, there was no Welsh doctors at the asylum. They were all from Scotland. Oh, gosh, right. Because that's, that was the training hub for right. psychiatrists. So yeah. they would come down. He came down and he opened the asylum. He was fully involved in every single part of it, mm-hmm. down to what colour the wallpaper was. He was very involved. Wow. And uh, he was there until 1877. Yeah. And he got a better job. So he left us and went to um, Asylum in Glasgow um, to run it there. Yeah. And he spent the rest of his life there. He um, lived there, him and his wife. They had their kids there. The kids were brought up in the asylum Mm -hmm. um, with the patients. One of the patients was his children's nanny. This is how he believed that a lot of them weren't actually harmless. They could do everything everybody else could do, but Mm -hmm. they just needed a little bit more help. Yeah, yeah. But his um, sons, all of them, became psychiatrists. So I'm in contact with some of his relatives. Good and Lord. all of them are psychiatrists. Wow, um, that's fantastic. His sons, his grandsons. Yeah. I think there's only one of them that's not a psychiatrist, but they've all stayed in the same field. And he was the first one. Right, okay. Well, it sounds like he was a bit of a pioneer anyway. It sounds like yeah, he he's had... known all over the world. Good Lord. And he happened to set up the one in Bridgend so in a way we're quite lucky yeah, we definitely as, are as far as asylums go yeah yeah it which could, yeah to be could, fair could yeah, be a lot worse we do need to put it into context <laughs> um, we're talking about the institutions of the asylums that were established um, all over Victorian Britain but particularly here in uh, in, in the Glamorgan area uh, mainly around Bridgend um, now we talked a little bit about the early days of the one in Bridgend and um, it, it sounds like it was a lot more enlightened than I was expecting. Certainly uh, it sounds uh, like people's treatment was very different from what I was expecting. But you dropped a few hints that things did change. Um, yes. <laughs> so w- w- besides the fact that um, we lost the, the, the Dr. Yellowlees, w- were there any other factors that, that drove the change? I mean, was there a change in how people perceived these things should be dealt with? I think it was more. Uh, it was more that there were so many people coming into the asylum when it was oh, built. Right, okay. There was only room for three hundred and fifty people. Mm-hmm. By eighteen seventy one, there were six hundred people there. Right. So it got okay. to the point without wow. overcrowding as well. The yeah. people were sleeping in corridors. Oh right. And you know, so when people get unmanageable mm-hmm. the first thing they're doing is giving them drugs yeah and there is a particular doctor that was there that was a very um liberal with his drugs right okay um when i've read the case notes i know which is very sad that i know the doctors now by their handwriting oh, oh, right. so that's how much i've done so. work on this <laughs> <laughs> so i know that is his handwriting and I know that it's him and I can tell by the drugs that he is using Yeah. that is this specific doctor. Yeah. So he, again, was a very well-known doctor. He 
uh, travelled the world giving papers on insanity, mm-hmm. and but he liked to inject people with things mm-hmm. to see what would happen. Oh no! Yeah. So when you get you sort of get these doctors that are so it it's a diff- completely different chain. So you've got Doctor Yellowlees, yeah. And then you've got another doctor that's come in, and a lot of these patients are incurable. Yeah. They they're not going to be let out. Mm-hmm. So it's like, why don't we try this? Right. And it's it's horrific. Yeah. It's absolutely horrific. Wow. And how long did that go on for? You only see it in snippets of the case files. Right. So you've got to go looking for it. So yeah. it's not something that is in your face. Mm-hmm. But when you look through the case files, you see different stories. So there was a one child that had um, a problem with her thyroid. Mm-hmm. So he injected her with a sheep's thyroid. Right. Even though he knew nothing was going to happen, mm-hmm. but he did it just to see what would happen. Oh, gosh. So there's a drastic change, and yeah. he was the one that would give people morphine mm-hmm. and chloroform and digitalis to calm them down and mm-hmm. sedate them, because they're a lot... They, <laughs> that sounds awful. It's a lot easier for them to deal with other patients if one that is constantly angry or violent mm-hmm. is subdued but so it's a lazy way of dealing with overcrowding very lazy. so if you've got somebody who's playing up you sedate them so you don't have yeah. to deal with it properly yeah awful yeah. thinking that the person is not getting a benefit of being there at all if they're yeah. just sedated constantly yeah and you see that with uh, photographs as well because by 1890 it was compulsory to for every patient to have their photograph taken when they came in right and if they were there for a long time they have photographs every so often so they you can chart the progress of the patient but you can see in the photographs that some of them are sedated mm-hmm. and some of mm-hmm. them are high right what we would call yeah high now yeah to calm them down right yeah Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, were there any? I mean, were there any success stories? Because we we we're kind of wandering into the area of uh, of, of how awful it became. I mean, did did people come people, out? And yeah, people came out and didn't go back. Oh right, okay. Lots of people did, um, but obviously my research yeah, focuses the, on yeah, the bits. There's and, more, I can, uh, yeah, there's more people that came back. The, repeatedly came back yeah so it was a three strike rule if you were in there three times yeah you weren't leaving right okay uh one woman well i say woman she was 16 and she oh, suffered God. with uh what we'd call pmt now right. and she was admitted three times mm-hmm. and then she ended up in ely hospital in cardiff oh wow so, so how much later was that um, this she was admitted in 1880, yeah, and she died in the hospital in Cardiff in the 1930s. Lord. So, yeah, yeah, Dear me, that's a the, yeah. So oh, wow. Well, I'm interested in what life uh, might have been like for people who were in these institutions. I yeah. know you've done a lot and lot of research on individual stories, and I believe you've got one with a local connection. Is that right? I do. Okay. Yes. I know it's not a chirpy one. It's, it's definitely, death, it's definitely so not So let chirpy. me just pre-warn you, if you're looking for a happy ending, this it's, ain't it. No. <laughs> um, I was looking through a case file, and I found the case of a woman that was in the, in the asylum for postnatal depression. Mm-hmm. So I did a bit of research, and I found out she's from Barry Dock, Oh, there we are. And her and her husband weren't getting along. Mm-hmm. And there was a very public divorce. It was in all of the papers. Right. And she was in and out of the asylum because of the stress. Mm-hmm. So in 18... No, I lied. 1908, mm-hmm. they had a divorce, which was very uncommon at that time. And during that time, men were given the rights to the children. Women weren't. Oh. So the children had to stay with the father. He stopped her from seeing the children. Right. And this caused turmoil. Mm-hmm. And she would come to the house and she would kick off. Mm-hmm. Then she'd be taken to the asylum and she would recover. And he would repeat and repeat to the point that she wasn't allowed to see the children at all. Yeah. She moved to Cardiff. Yeah. And the last time someone saw her, she was drunk in the street. Yeah very very drunk and a month later they found her in the canal oh my god on valentine's day 1916 oh wow 
Bling. That's not. That's not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not the most chirpiest of stories I've ever heard. Um, but I suppose, I mean, if if you've got complex mental needs, how 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 could they have possibly known how to have dealt with them? But I mean, did 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 they have how how kind of down the road of being able to identify how to deal with that sort of thing? Did they have, or was it just keep them locked up in their rooms or and sedate them? That was it. Um, a lot. A lot of it was occupational therapy. Yeah. So to keep the mind busy and to pr promote good thoughts. This yeah. Actually, it's actually a quote. Right. From, oh, okay. You know, promote good thoughts. So they had. Uh, so they'd be working on the farms. Yeah. A lot of the gardens they had massive. Open air courts, mm -hmm. so they could go out gardening. They could go walking. Yeah. Some people had freedom of parole. Right. So they could go out as long as they came back, mm -hmm. which is quite. A very good bit of freedom you've got during that time. Yeah, yeah. People were working in the bakehouse. They had their own brass band. Right. The Dr. Yellies again. Um, he <laughs> bought everyone brass instruments, so he kitted them out. He yeah. bought them a library of books. Yeah. They had goldfish. They had aquariums in every single day room. They had birds in every single day room. Right. They played cricket. They used to, used to take them to the beach. Wow. And all the, these different things, again, at the start. Yeah. But as it went on, I think it was easier for people to be put into seclusion. Yeah. And sort of, when they got too much then, they were there for a long time. They were sent to other hospitals, so like Ely Lodge, Ely Hospital, yeah. Witchurch Hospital. Yeah. Sort of farmed out, really. Right, okay. Yeah. So, th th was there a, a a reason why the numbers grew as much? Was it just more people living in the area because of the? Yeah, well, Bridgend itself, the asylum didn't actually just cater for Bridgend. Right. So it catered for basically all of Glamorgan. So you've got people in there from Pontypridd, Merthyr, mm -hmm. Rhondda. Quite a small percentage of the people they were actually from Bridgend. Oh right, okay. Yeah. So when people, I don't know I've heard the quip so many times, so we're going to send you to Bridgend. Mm -hmm. No, not many people from Bridgend are actually there. Right. The only the, there was more attendance there, it's what we call psychiatric nurses, yeah. from Bridgend than actual patients. Oh right, okay. But there's people from all around the world there. Oh One the people I've been researching is from Russia. There are people from Poland, people from Barbados, and they've just ended up. They've come here, and then they've ended up somewhere like that. So how? So. Pick any of those. How do you get from Poland stroke Russia stroke out? How did you end up in Bridgend? Was the family moved to this country and then they got institutionalized? Yeah. Or? Oh, right. Okay. But it's when you go, because that obviously brings as well a language barrier. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And there was a big argument in the 1890s because a lot of people were coming in from the countryside yeah. and they couldn't speak English. Oh. So they had to put a legislation in to recruit attendants that only spoke Welsh mm -hmm. so they could translate because, you know, you've got doctors from Scotland yeah, and they're not going to be able to understand Welsh. No, no, and then patients that are speaking Welsh aren't going to be able to understand them. So there's a, that communication barrier. Yeah, And there were other attendants there that could speak different languages. So with the Russian lady that I've been researching, there was an attendant there that would translate for her. Right. What do we know about the Russian lady? Where, where did she come from and who it's was not, she? It's not a very good story. Oh, is it? Not? It's, it's not a nice story. Wow. <laughs> um, but it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one in the sense that she was certified as a criminal. Uh -huh. So she came to um, Pontypridd with her husband from Riga. Mm-hmm. And uh, during the 1880s, when they were trying to get all the Jewish people to leave, mm -hmm. so she, they came and they settled in Pontypridd. Yeah. And she was in the asylum once for postnatal depression. Yeah. And she left, and she'd recovered. And two years later, she had another child, mm -hmm. and she had undiagnosed postnatal depression. Yeah. And one day, she took her eldest daughter out of school, and threw her in the River Taff. Oh wow. And she was certified um, insane for the rest of her life. She died in 1909. Mm -hmm. 
and she spent the re- she spent all of her life there's a in there. that it, it, that's reminded me of something I was um, listening to quite recently um, and it was a case of um, a nurse who had who was killing her patients yeah it happened in Taunton uh, you probably know the case better than I do um, but the 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 opinion of the law if you like so it's pre- yeah. the precedent laid out for judges to follow is it was assumed that all women were naturally maternal yeah so if a woman didn't acted in a way that was not perceived to be maternal the only possible uh, judgment was that that she was um a lunatic that she was unstable it was it was it was her mind not working so um, a lot of people being sent into institutions who were criminals, but the, 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 the law, the way the law was set out, didn't recognize the distinction between somebody who was not functioning properly and somebody who was... Yeah, a- if she had had, it's a perfect example of if she'd had the right treatment or the treatment that we have now, yeah, she would have been fine and her daughter wouldn't have been killed. Yeah, You yeah. know, she, she basically walked out of her house one day and threw her child in a river. Yeah. And she was certified criminally insane. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what. Well, by the time we got to there, I suppose that's probably yeah about right. But uh, yeah, intervention would have uh, definitely. Oh yeah, made a it would have definitely. Without, yeah. And that's a lot with a lot of patients. Yeah. Intervention. But it's, it's easy to look back now oh, and be like. You can't apply modern eyes on what went on. Yeah, it's very easy world. to look back yeah. now, and be oh, how wonderful would it have been if they had this help but they didn't yeah at the end of the day yeah so no, no and i think with a lot of the asylums and doctors as well that people did the best that they thought they could do yeah we look back on things and you know a lot of the stuff that was happened was awful yeah but some doctors did what they thought they they genuinely thought at the time they were doing right yeah yeah and it's only looking back you know hindsight yeah wonderful thing we have been talking about the asylum the Glamorgan asylum uh, in Bridgend um, it hasn't been that chirpy up till now <laughs> but then we knew it was a dark subject it's just you know can't be helped um, but we're going to talk uh, some more about some of the personal stories of some of the people that were there um, and there were a couple of people who managed to either make the best of it or, or, or beat the system um, we started talking earlier about um, a particularly interesting one um, you were telling me about, about, about a lady of the night. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, a sex worker from Swansea. She was um, committed to the asylum once and then she recovered. Yeah. And the second time she escaped. Right. She, one night she decided to take an attendance uniform, put right. it on. Yeah. She climbed the fence and we're talking 12 foot barbed wire glass on the top oh fence. Oh my word. And there was a huge search party for her. Yeah. They never found her. Oh wow. They don't know what happened to her. But on her casebook it says discharged as relieved. So she'd automatically been discharged because they couldn't find her. Because they couldn't find her. Oh, that was a good loophole to know about. If they give up after a while. (laughs) There was a lot of attempted escapes, but I think she's one of two people that actually did escape. They think that she got on a train Mm -hmm. and just went. But she's a very interesting woman. She's very, um, from what I've researched and read about her. Yeah. She's. I quite like her. She's what else do we know about her then? How, where, um, she was a swindler, you know. Oh, right. She was in and out of the workhouse. <clears throat> she was in prison. Yeah. And she'd go into prison for doing something. She'd do it again. Yeah. And that's what you get. Was well, that or starve, isn't it? That's yeah, the, that's what you get to learn that. with <laughs> some of the people in there. Yeah. They live in how they know best to live. Mm. And if you're in and out of prison, you're in and out of prison. Yeah, yeah. And you've got you've got a bed for the night. You've got three me three meals. Well, yeah. By comparison, I mean it's 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 not that bad, is it? But the, when I came across this story, it, one of there's not many of the nice ones, but yeah, yeah. It did make me laugh that when I read her case file, it said discharged as relieved because they couldn't find her. It just says she escaped, and then a month later, cause they had about twenty eight days. Yeah. And if they couldn't find them. It's not the asylum's problem anymore. Sign it off, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. And what about people who managed to make the best of it while they were there? Uh, One interesting one. um, 
called Thomas, he had the delusion that he was the king of Swansea. Okay. <laughs> and he was admitted to Vernon House Asylum when he was 21. Yeah. And he's very interesting and he's... I don't want to pick favourites, but he is one of my favourites. Right, okay. But he had what we would now class as learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. So he would... N now, I say we shouldn't say in hindsight, but he would definitely be living in assisted living. Mm -hmm. But he came to Glamorgan Asylum when it first opened. He was one of the first 15 patients in there. Right. And he took to it straight away. Yeah. He worked as a porter. Mm -hmm. He worked on front of a house. He was welcoming people in. The commissioners were coming in. He was on the door. <laughs> he looked after the medical superintendent's horses. He ran the stables. Oh, okay. He ran the dining hall. Anything that he could do to help, yeah. he would do it. And he had complete freedom of parole. But he never he never went outside. He didn't want to go. But he could, if he had the opportunity, he could go if he wanted to. Yeah. As long as he came back in the night. But he didn't. But just chose he to just, because... He was happy where he was. And if you're there from when you're 21. Yeah. And he died in 1892. Right. So he was there for a good 40 years. Oh, wow. But that was his home. That's all he knew. Yeah. Yeah. But that's... A situation where he's made the best of a bad situation really without a doubt and he was very loved by everyone yeah like he is the only patient that has a gravestone he's buried with the staff in the oh, staff wow. part of the graveyard and they all chipped in Good Lord. and he has a very nice stone gravestone and it says on it thomas reese yeah demented king <laughs> right <Okay. laughs> a demented king <clears throat> that's what he liked he liked to be called it Right. If people didn't call him it, he'd be like, call me the king. That's my title, yeah. And it says, erected in affectionate memory by staff of this asylum. And it's Good Lord, beautiful. that's fantastic. So, because I realised there was a cemetery there. I didn't realise it was only staff who were there. I didn't realise... Well, that's a whole other thing. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. yeah. Come on, so let's have it now. I've scratched the, that one. Um, the cemetery. So, all in all, there's three cemeteries. Mm -hmm. The one where the staff are, the only ones with the gravestones. Oh, I see, right. Okay. So, they're all in one corner in the nice bit, and yeah. there's ten gravestones there. Seven that you can see, the other ones are tipped over, but we're working on that. Mm -hmm. And the rest are in the field next door. Right. So, you have a big line of trees, mm -hmm. and there's hundreds of people there, hundreds of people, and you've got graves that are multiple occupancy. Oh, so you've got about three or four people in the same grave yeah. because of the rate of death. Mm -hmm. So when Caswell Clinic was built, they had to dig the bodies up. Oh god! And some of them were put in a they were put in a mass <coughs> grave in mm -hmm. Sand Cemetery. Right. So there's that big open field, and then if you go over the bridge at the back of Glenreed now, mm -hmm. there's another burial ground that has a world war one grave in it and that's hundreds of people there's hundreds of people in there hundreds of people but all unmarked no yeah um, the, all there, unmarked yeah. because the crosses that were used were iron so they were still they were sold for scrap oh right and when park prison was built yeah. and the new house in the state yeah. there's a patch of grass by the side of the road going up to Coiti. yeah and that's part of the that's a burial ground as well Oh, is it really? Yeah. Oh, they, have uh, they not seen the film Poltergeist? Um, <laughs> they tried. They did. Try, they did try to sell it, but yeah. uh, someone complained and got it taken off the market. Wow! Well, thank heavens for that. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. So, there were a couple of people who were who were managed to make the most of it or get out or or, or, or somehow rise above the the whole situation not that many though by the sounds no. of it they, most of them are tragic stories i think there's only so many people i can research so oh no that's right that's right there's and i recently found out that my uncle was there oh wow in 1889 and that was a complete Never heard about him in my life. Right. He was there. And he died there as well. Well, I suppose people kind of didn't talk about it, didn't they? If somebody uh, was in there, it was all hushed up, I imagine, because of how yeah, straight it goes, these people it's were. Yeah, it's either one way. It's either people do not talk about it, mm -hmm. or people do not stop talking about it. And I right. quite like that people don't stop talking yeah, about yeah. it. But a lot of people with my research have come to me, and I've helped them find their relatives mm -hmm. that were there. And a lot of people don't know they exist. Like for my uncle, for example... He's buried, I found out he's buried in San. I didn't know anything about him. And he was in the asylum for 10 years. Wow. And he went 
he lost his mind yeah. because of money worries yeah. and his brother couldn't cope. So he was in there. Good Lord. I mean, it all sounds so relatable, doesn't it? Everyone, well, a lot of people I know have the connection with, because the scope of the asylum and mm. the sort of where people came from, Yeah. you always know someone that's got a connection. Yeah. So when I talk to people about it, someone will say, oh, my relative was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know someone was there. Yeah. It's... I'm... I, I, positive by the law of averages my family would have had people in there absolutely no doubt at all all the Bridgen Brinkethin area that's where my family are from so they're, they're all as mad as badgers so there's, there's bound to have been somebody at some point went a little bit too far um but th you said mentioned earlier the be at the outset really the gland read is still yeah operational what does it do now i mean obviously it's 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 a different world for the place that we've been it's talking more or about. less well it's not an asylum yeah yeah so <laughs> that's a good start it's still a mental health facility. Right. They have they have Caswell Clinic, which is the uh, the private bit for low level criminals. All right. And they have, um, I I think they have an Alzheimer's unit there now. Right. In the main building. Yeah. And they have clinics there now. Yeah. But it's it's not a stay. Yes. So you can go home. Yeah, yeah. But obviously with Park, it's now a prison. And yeah, I was going to say, yeah, Park is yeah. now a prison. So, and uh, and the other one was Penave, is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, it's been and demolished now. What is the, what's going there? Do we know anything? Is there houses or something? Or is it no, just it's part of the, the road. Oh, right, I see. Yeah. Because when you look at old photos, it's really odd because the asylum, there's one track. Yeah. And Penave is opposite. Right. And so you wouldn't even know where it was now unless no. you looked at a photograph. You wouldn't know it was there. Well, I remember it being, it was still, I'm sure it was still in existence when I was little because I grew up in the 1970s. So I'm pretty sure the building was still there. And I remember certainly a sign that you drove past, but I haven't driven up that way in a while and stopped to think about, oh, I wonder where that's gone. So so it's under, all right, so it's now part of the road network yeah. in that area. Right, okay. That was a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's not your fault. I know I was hoping it might be something more exciting. There we are. Okay. Um, Leuven, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you about this uh, this delicate in some areas subject. Lots of lots of pain and suffering and darkness. A few mo glimmers of hope. Um, a, a, a pioneering doctor uh, at the beginning of it all. And then somebody not that far from Joseph Mengler, the way you described him. So I, I don't think he was, yes, he, he, he necessarily kept up the good work, but intriguing all the same. The incredible stuff that went on there. Thank you so much for coming down today to talk to us about it. Um, that's all we've got time for on tonight's show, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so uh, there'll be another program coming to you in four weeks time. We'll give you more information about that soon. Um, but before we wrap up and uh, and send our way uh, home, we uh, just want to make one little announcement. Now that is that um, I have I have a new book out, um, which is always fantastic. Um, this one is uh, a bit of a departure from the previous ones. This this maps the uh, the movements of a family who are trying to flee the war in Poland. Uh, but ended up in German-occupied France, what life was like day to day, living in an occupied country, how they try to present this veneer of normality with all that was frantically going on behind the scenes. Those members of the family who managed to escape and uh, fight for what was the Polish Free Army, which of course was aligned a to the British Army. Uh, and what happened at the end of the war when they came to settle in pont So So... Um, I'm also doing a talk, 6th of October, date for your diary, 6th of October from 6 p.m. in Cowbridge Town Hall. Um, I'm doing a talk about all, because this is a true story, so all the real people, the real history, the real stories uh, that go together to make up the book. So um, if you check out grahamlovelagedwards.com forward slash events, you'll find all the information you need there. So look, until the next time we meet, look after yourselves and take care. Mm -hmm.